Now in our 25th year, a quarter of a century of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are this week in Amateur Radio. Your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition, number 1331 with a release and air date of Saturday, August 31st, 2024. Please take the program to your air following the cue tone. On the air worldwide on the amateur bands, and streaming on the internet since 1993, serving the amateur radio community with weekly, reliable, amateur radio news and special features, we are, this week in amateur radio. The worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1331, of this week in amateur radio. The ARRL launches a new program called Resilience Through Amateur Radio for National Preparedness Month. The International Telecommunications Union updates its global treaty to enhance radio spectrum use. The ARRL pays a hefty ransom to resolve its recent cyber attack. We will have the story. The ARRL Club Grant Program will release its new round of grants in November. We will have a short feature entitled, What Happens to Your Stuff When You Become a Silent Key? The Voice of America shutters its Marianas Island transmitter site. The candidates are named for the ARRL director and vice director positions. The league expands its online publication archive. The ARRL urges amateurs to comment on the proposed changes to the 900 MHz band. The Polaris Dawn mission is set for a historic launch and first commercial spacewalk. A memorandum of understanding has been signed by the FCC and the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. And, we will leave you with a short amateur radio story this week. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio, will tell us how to lose more than half of your membership. Our own amateur radio historian, Will Rogers, K5WLR will be here with another edition of A Century of Amateur Radio. This week he brings us back in time to the early 1920s, to look at aerials, attachments, and audibility. We will stop by and visit with Bill Salliers, AJ8B in the DX Corner, with all the latest news on DX Peditions, DX, Radio Sport, upcoming contests, and more. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio, where the leaves on the trees are turning red, and fall is in the air, this is W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Salem, Ohio, this is Denny Haight, NZ8D. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau in Knoxville, Tennessee, where we're getting ready for the Tennessee CUSO party this weekend, I'm Josh Marler, AA4WX. And reporting from our news bureau this week, from amateur station K2MST, inside the Museum of Science and Technology in Armory Square, downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine. KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, where the cooler weather is starting to show up here in upstate New York, bringing autumn with it. In the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our Train New York news bureau, where we're hoping the mild weather lasts throughout the Labor Day weekend, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. In recording from our news basement here in Scotia, New York, I'm Savo, K2SAV. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York on the Labor Day holiday weekend, and where the boys in blue are out on the interstate looking for you with radar, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're waiting with great anticipation for a promised drop in temperatures, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now is our lead story. Here is Denny Haight, NZAT. Leading off our news this week, amateur radio is an excellent tool for community resilience in times of crisis. To tell us more about National Preparedness Month, we go to League Headquarters, where John Ross, KD8IDJ, files this report. 
The utility value of the critical communications it provides is enhanced by having well-trained local amateur radio emergency service, ARIES groups, and other teams. However, to maximize the value to yourself, your family, and your community, an operator must be prepared. September is National Preparedness Month. ARRL's partners at the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, are sharing tips to help you be prepared. They are centered around the theme of Start a Conversation. An ARRL Director of Emergency Management, Josh Johnson, KE5MHV, is starting that conversation with radio amateurs to help make sure you, your station, and your family are ready for whatever may come your way. It's important that we take steps to ensure that not only are we ready to provide assistance to our served agencies, but we have a plan for our own families as well, he said. Over the month of September, ARRL will share best practices to help prepare you, your station, and your family, and your local ARIES groups to thrive in times of emergency. There are times when hams may be activated to serve when all aspects of your life, your station, and your environment are under stress, and that's not the time to start planning or discover shortcomings, said Johnston. Johnston encourages any radio amateur who is interested in participating in ARIES to reach out to their local ARRL emergency coordinator. And if you don't know who that is, find your local ARRL affiliated club or reach out to your ARRL section manager, whose contact details you can find on page 16 of QST or at www.arrl.org slash sections. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. You can find resources for ARIES at www.arrl.org slash A-R-E-S and tools to help plan your family's resilience at www.ready.gov. The International Telecommunication Union released this week an updated version of the radio regulations, the international treaty governing the global use of radio frequency spectrum and satellite orbits. Entering into force on January 1, 2025, the 2024 edition of the ITU radio regulations is the result of a four-year process that culminated in four weeks of negotiations during the World Radio Communication Conference 23, hosted last year in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. The ITU radio regulations govern the global use of radio frequency spectrum and satellite orbits for all radio services, systems, and applications, including fixed and mobile broadband, satellite systems, sound and TV broadcasting, radio navigation, meteorological monitoring and prediction, space research and earth exploration, amateur radio services, and other topics. The 2024 edition of the Radio Regulations marks a significant milestone in the world of technology, said ITU Secretary General Doreen Bogdan Martin. As technological progress advances and the demand for spectrum grows, the international treaty continues to evolve to accommodate new radio communication services and applications, minimize interference between services, and ensure equitable access to this essential resource. Treaty provisions also direct how radio equipment and systems must operate to ensure efficient and effective coexistence among various services worldwide and anywhere in space, optimizing the usage of today's increasingly crowded airwaves. The 2024 radio regulations identifies new spectrum resources to support technological innovation, deepen global connectivity, increase access to and equitable use of space-based radio resources, and enhance safety at sea, in the air, and on land. The updated radio regulations are the result of hard-won agreements reached at WRC 23 and a testament to the unwavering spirit of cooperation and compromise among all of our members to negotiate timely changes to the international treaty, said Mario Manowitz, director of the ITU Radio Communication Bureau. The updated treaty provides a framework for national spectrum management that aligns with international standards and guarantees the stable, predictable regulatory environment that is essential for the development of innovative radio communication services for all. Global regulation of the radio spectrum began with the signing of the first International Radio Telegraph Convention in Berlin on November 3, 1906, after 30 states came together and agreed on key maritime communications and safety provisions and established SOS as a globally recognized distress signal. Since then, the radio regulations have evolved into a four-volume treaty of more than 2,000 pages. 
The treaty establishes the rights and obligations of ITU's 193 member states and now covers more than 40 different radio communication services, spanning frequencies from 8.3 kHz to 3000 GHz. The 2024 radio regulations are available in all six UN official languages with electronic versions that can be downloaded free of charge. Print and DVD versions will be available for purchase in the coming weeks. Now celebrating our 25th year keeping the amateur radio community around the world informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at twiar.net. The ARRL now acknowledges that it resolved last spring's cyber hacking incident by paying a hefty ransom. Our own Chris Perrine is there with the story. Earlier this week, the ARRL released the following report to its members. It reads as follows. Sometime in early May 2024, ARRL Systems Network was compromised by threat actors, or TAs, using information they had purchased on the dark web. The TAs accessed headquarters on-site systems and most cloud-based systems. They used a wide variety of payloads affecting everything from desktops and laptops to Windows-based and Linux-based servers. Despite the wide variety of target configurations, the TAs seem to have a payload that would host and execute encryption or deletion of network-based IT assets, as well as launch demands for a ransom payment for every system. This serious incident was an act of organized crime. The highly coordinated and executed attack took place during the early morning hours of May 15th. That morning, as staff arrived, it was immediately apparent that the ARRL had become the victim of an intensive and sophisticated ransomware attack. The FBI categorized the attack as unique, as they had not seen this level of sophistication among the many other attacks they have experienced. Within three hours, a crisis management team had been constructed of ARRL management, an outside vendor with extensive resources and experience in the ransomware recovery space, attorneys experienced with managing the legal aspects of the attack, including interfacing with the authorities and our insurance carrier. The authorities were contacted immediately, as was ARRL president. The ransom demands by the TAs in exchange for access to their decryption tools were exorbitant. It was clear they didn't know and didn't care that they had attacked a small 501c3 organization with limited resources. Their ransom demands were dramatically weakened by the fact that they did not have access to any compromising data. It was also clear that they believed ARRL had extensive insurance coverage that would cover a multi-million dollar ransom payment. After days of tense negotiation and brinkmanship, ARRL agreed to pay $1 million in ransom. That payment, along with the cost of restoration, has been largely covered by our insurance policy. From the start of the incident, the ARRL board met weekly using a continuing special board meeting for full progress reports and to offer assistance. In the first few meetings, there were significant details to cover and the board was thoughtfully engaged asked important questions, and was fully supported of the team at headquarters to keep the restoration efforts moving. Member updates were posted to a single page on the website and were posted across the Internet in many forums and groups. ARRL worked closely with professionals deeply experienced in ransomware matters on every post. It is important to understand that the TAs had ARRL under a magnifying glass while we were negotiating. Based on the expert advice we were being given, we could not publicly communicate anything informative, useful, or potentially antagonistic to the TAs during this time frame. Today, most systems have been restored or are waiting for interfaces to come back online to interconnect them. 
While we have been in restoration mode, we have also been working to simplify the infrastructure to the extent possible. We anticipate that it may take another month or two to complete restoration under the new infrastructure guidelines and new standards. Most ARRL member benefits remained operational during the attack. One that wasn't was Logbook of the World, which was one of our most popular benefits. LOTW data was not impacted by the attack, and once the environment was ready to again permit access to the public to ARRL network-based servers, we returned LOTW to service. The fact that Logbook of the World took less than four days to get through a backlog that at times exceeded over 60,000 logs was outstanding. The board at the ARRL second board meeting in July voted to approve a new committee, the Information Technology Advisory Committee. This will be comprised of ARRL staff, board members with demonstrated experience in IT, and additional members from the IT industry who are currently employed as subject matter experts in a few areas. They will help analyze and advise on future steps to take with the ARRL IT within the financial means available to the organization. We thank you for your patience as we navigated our way through this. The emails of moral support and offers of IT expertise were well received by the team. Although we are not entirely out of the woods yet and are still working to restore minor servers that serve internal needs, such as various email services like bulk mail and some internal reflectors, we are happy with the progress that has been made and for the incredible dedication of the staff and consultants who continue to work together to bring this incident to a successful conclusion. Applications for the 2024 AWRL Club Grants Program are now being reviewed. The application period closed July 26, 2024. AWRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, said 110 grant applications have been received and the awards will be announced in late November. Grants are available up to $25,000 and emphasis is given to projects that are transformative in nature, said Walters. Examples of projects include, but are not limited to, getting on the air projects, ham training and skills development through mentoring, STEM and STEAM learning through amateur radio, station resources for use by the ham community, and emergency communications and public service projects that emphasize training. Since 2022, $500,000 has been distributed to amateur radio clubs, says Walters. With this year's awards, the total will increase to $1 million awarded. The AWRL Club Grants are administered by the AWRL Foundation. August is National Make-A-Will Month. So, what happens to all your radio gear when you become a silent key? Here with a few details is John Ross, KD8IDJ. So I'm asked a bunch show that nearly two-thirds of Americans don't have a plan. For some, it's procrastination. Others don't know where to start. So many times we hear from the family of a silent key who are overwhelmed with what to do with a lifetime worth of amateur radio gear, said ARR Director of Development Kevin Beal, K8EAL. Simply thinking through what needs to be done ahead of time can prevent the stress on our loved ones after we are gone. ARRL this week held a webinar hosted by Beal and Dino Pappas, KL0S, to discuss the steps of planning. It is important that unfortunately doesn't get a lot of attention. The bottom line up front is what happens to all of our beloved ham gear when that inevitable day comes along when we become a silent key. Unfortunately, that day may arrive unexpectedly, so we need to prepare ahead of time and make it as simple as possible for our family, said Pappas. On the ARRL HQ YouTube channel, you can see a replay of the 52-minute presentation along with the question and answer section at the end. Your station is an asset just like anything else you built and put resources into. Deciding now what happens when you become a silent key can solidify your legacy to ham radio, said Beal. The ARRL Legacy Circle recognizes the generosity of individuals who have planned support for ARRL through wills, trust, life insurance gifts, and other ways. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The ARRL Legacy Circle ensures that ARRL and amateur radio will continue to thrive for generations to come. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net.
Citing a shrinking listener audience, high costs of operation, and lingering damages inflicted by a Category 5 super typhoon in October of 2018, the Voice of America has decided to discontinue transmissions from its shortwave station in the northern Mariana Islands. The move was reported by local media in the U.S. Pacific Territory based on a letter from the United States Agency for Global Media. I suspect your organization has heard over the past weeks about a big change taking place at the U.S. Agency for Global Media's Robert E. Camosa Transmitting Station, or R-E-K-T-S. The change is a discontinuation of all shortwave radio transmissions at our Saipan and Tinian sites, the first step in closing the station, according to the letter. REKTS consists of a transmitter and antenna system at Anjin Point on the southwestern part of Saipan, and a second transmitter and antenna system on the western side of Tinian. The site was used for multiple language programming from Radio Free Asia and Voice of America into the East Asia region. William Martin, director of the U.S. Transmitting Stations and Operations Division, stated that by now many of you have heard that the Voice of America shortwave station on Saipan and Tinian, which operates under the U.S. Agency for Global Media, are closing. After decades of operation, these facilities are being phased out and shortwave audiences migrate to other media. Although these closures mark the end of an era, they are also bittersweet, as in closing these stations, we also say farewell to the people and communities that supported our mission for so many years. On behalf of the agency, I would like to thank our staff and the many community members who contributed meaningfully to the station's operation these many years. Martin served as station manager from 2013 to 2019. In recent years, U.S. Agency for Global Medias has sought to redirect resources from shortwave broadcasting to other channels based on where it can best reach its desired audience. In the 2025 Budget for Justification document, the agency noted a full review of shortwave and medium-wave broadcasting requirements, leading to some reductions in regions where agency research shows that shortwave audiences have become vanishingly small. An additional challenge for the facility was lingering damage from Category 5 Super Typhoon U2, which destroyed the station's infrastructure on October of 2018. According to a government report, the storm shredded 16 shortwave curtain antennas at the site and downed one of its support towers. Using salvaged parts, five of the antennas were fully restored by the end of fiscal year 2020, and three more were back in operation by the end of 2023, with parts for three additional antennas on site. The site on Saipan first went on the air in 1982 as Super Rock KYOI, a commercial station targeting Japan with rock and pop music. It was acquired in 1986 by Herald Broadcasting Service. Radio Free Asia began leasing the transmitters in September of 1996 and purchased the facility in 1999. Construction of the Tinian site began in 1993 when the U.S. Department of Defense transferred 834 acres of land on the island to the U.S. Information Agency. In recent years, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and other U.S. government broadcast services have increasingly relied on non-shortwave platforms to get their messages across to international listeners. The Federal Communications Commission accepted for public comment a petition for rulemaking filed by NextNav Incorporated, a licensee in the 900 megahertz location and monitoring service, or LMS to completely reconfigure the 902 through 928 MHz band and replace the LMS with high-powered 5G cellular and related location services. The FCC notice requested comment on the effects that NextNav's proposals would have on amateur radio operations in the band. The FCC notice requested comment on the effects that NextNav's proposals would have on amateur radio operations in the band, the AWRL said. The National Association for Amateur Radio is preparing comments urging protection of existing and future amateur uses in this band and urges all amateurs to file their own comments describing their activities in this band and the expected effect of the proposed changes. 
NextNav currently holds licenses in the 900 megahertz band that authorizes it to provide services limited to determining the location and status of mobile radio units. NextNav ties its request to provide high-power broadband, cellular, and location services to the vulnerabilities of the current satellite-based GPS system and urges that implementation of its proposal would complement GPS by providing an alternative nationwide terrestrial location system in addition to cellular and broadband services. Under its proposal, NextNav would be designated the sole nationwide licensee for this spectrum in exchange for its more limited licenses. The new nationwide license would authorize NextNav to provide much higher powered traditional broadband and 5G cellular services as well as the related location service occupying 15 of the total 26 MHz available in the band. The reconfiguration proposed by NextNav would create a 5 MHz wide uplink subband at 902 to 907 MHz, paired with a 10 MHz downlink subband at 918 to 928 MHz. The 5 MHz uplink subband would be limited to use by mobiles with a maximum of 3 watts ERP. On the 10 MHz downlink subband, up to 2,000 watts ERP would be permitted in rural areas and 1,000 watts ERP in urban and suburban areas, radiating from tower structures that could reach 1,000 feet or more feet above average terrain. These configurations reflect the FCC's rules for standard cellular configurations that have been adopted to govern a number of other bands used for similar 5G and like services. Although uses by the amateur radio service in the band are secondary to LMS, NextNav is proposing substantial technical and use changes that would completely alter the foundation upon which the current rules and spectrum sharing arrangements rely and undercut shared use of the band by amateurs as well as a variety of other users. In addition, NextNav proposes deletion of a specific interference provision in the Commission's rules that was adopted to encourage and protect continued sharing with amateurs and other secondary users. NextNav, in this petition, argues without evidence that the changes that it proposes to the 902 to 928 MHz band will not impede amateur radio operations. In an eight-page description of NextNav's proposal released by the FCC's Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the FCC staff asked a series of questions that would clarify the proposal and help the Commission ascertain the likely effects of the proposed changes on existing users if the requested changes were adopted. Comment was specifically requested on the extent of amateur operations in the band, the potential impact of the proposed changes, any other spectrum options that may exist, and the cost for relocations if other options exist. AWRL is preparing comments urging protection for existing and future amateur uses in this band. AWRL urges all amateurs to study the proposal and file their own comments describing their activities in this band and the expected effect of the proposed changes. The filing deadline is September 5, 2024. Replies to comments are due by September 20th, 2024. You can find details on how to file comments with the Commission on the League's website. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission voted unanimously to begin a proceeding to update the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. Building on years of successful interagency collaboration, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking seeks comment on a wide range of potential rule changes to improve the Citizens Broadband Radio Service for all current and future users of the 3.55 through 3.7 GHz band. Preserving and enhancing the Citizens Broadband Radio Service continues the Commission's commitment to develop innovative, collaborative mechanisms to facilitate greater spectrum use. 
This NPRM follows other innovative spectrum management approaches taken earlier this year, such as the Commission's adoption of the supplemental coverage from space licensing framework and the approval of automated frequency systems to manage unlicensed use in the 6 GHz band. The 3.5 GHz band uses a three-tiered spectrum sharing model that protects incumbent access users, allows for geographically licensed operations following the FCC's 2020 auction of priority access licenses, and permits opportunistic license by rule general authorized access use for a wide variety of uses, including operations within factories, cities, hospitals, research centers, schools, public libraries, and utilities. The NPRM proposes to add definitions to Part 96 related to protection of federal incumbent users and modify other Part 96 rules governing such protections. It also proposes to sunset rules related to the transition of grandfathered wireless broadband services in the 3.65 to 3.7 GHz band. In addition to the specific proposals related to federal protection, the NPRM seeks comment on, among other things, whether to align 3.5 GHz protection methodologies with those in adjacent bands, revisit our environmental sensing capability approval procedures, and facilitate the continued introduction of citizens' broadband radio service in areas outside of the contiguous United States. With adoption of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, the FCC will take comments on the proposals in this item. Comments may be submitted through and read in the FCC's electronic comment filing system. Comments will be due in GN docket number 17-258, 30 days after Federal Register publication of the NPRM, and reply comments will be due 60 days after Federal Register publication. The AWRL has expanded member access to its rich archive of publications. This gives members access to back issues of League publications, with more on this exciting news, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, with more. The ARRL Periodicals Archive and Search now includes content from two more popular ARRL magazines, QEX, a forum for communications experimenters, which features technical articles and columns of interest to radio amateurs and communications professionals, and NCJ, the National Contest Journal, which covers information, scores, and advice from the world of competitive radio sport and the contributions of top contesters. Before accessing the archive, members should ensure they are first logged into the ARRL website. Members may now view and download articles from across the extensively indexed archive of QEX from 1981 to 2011 and NCJ from 1973 to 2011. Members can access and index and view copies of articles from the huge ARRL periodicals archive. The archive was first introduced to members in 2008, providing PDF copies of articles from the QST magazine archive. Since then, thousands of members have enjoyed searching, viewing, and printing their favorite articles, projects, and more. The archive is populated with QST articles from 1915 to 2011. While the archive includes access to downloading many older articles, the more recent and current issues of ARRL magazines continue to be available to members in a digital edition. Make sure you see www.arrl.org slash magazines for more information. ARRL members now have access to four digital edition magazines, QST, On the Air, QEX, and NCJ. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. While this archive includes access to downloading many older articles, the more recent and current issues of ARRL magazines continue to be available to members in a digital edition. You can see www.arrl.org slash magazines for more information. Access to the archive is an ARRL membership benefit and a service of the ARRL Technical Information Service. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, has announced that the candidates for the 2024 ARRL division elections are now official. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with all the details. ARRL members will choose between two candidates for director in the Hudson, New England, and Northwestern divisions. The sole candidates in the Central and Roanoke divisions for both director and vice director are unopposed. The vice director incumbents in the Hudson, New England, and Northwestern divisions are also unopposed. 
And elected without opposition in the Central Division, candidate and current Vice Director Brent Walls, N9BA, will be the next director, having served as Vice Director since 2021. And candidate Josh Long, W9HT, will be the next Vice Director. Both candidates are running unopposed. In the Hudson Division, Vice Director David Galetti, KM2O, has held the seat since 2024. In the New England Division, Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, who has served the role since 2020. In the Northwestern Division, Vice Director Michael Sterbuck, KG7HQ, who has served the role since 2024. And in the Roanoke Division, Director Jim Boehner, N2ZZ, who was elected back to the board in 2022. And Vice Director Bill Moraine, N2COP, was uh, elected to that seat and has held it since 2016. In the contested seats in the Hudson Division, Director Ed Wilson, N2XDD, will face challenger John Covelli, W2GD, for the seat. In the New England Division, Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, will face challenger Tom Frenet, K1KL, who has previously held the positions of Director and Vice President. In the Northwestern Division, Director Mark Tharp, KB7HDX, will run against Dan Marler, K7REX, who is currently a section manager. Balloting for contested seats will take place this fall. Votes will be counted and successful candidates announced in November. Candidates declared elected will assume their roles for terms beginning January 1st, 2025. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARRL is governed by its board of directors. Elections are held for five of the 15 ARRL divisions each year for terms of three years. German astronomer Johannes Kepler made sketches of sunspots in 1607 from his observations of the sun's surface, and centuries later, the pioneering drawings are helping scientists solve a solar mystery. Astronomers observed sunspots with telescopes for the first time in 1610, three years after Kepler's drawings and Kepler's long-disregarded sketches, overlooked because their drawings, rather than telescopic observations, could provide crucial historical insights. Kepler used a camera obscura, which utilized a small hole in the wall of the instrument to project the sun's image on a sheet of paper and sketch the features he observed. Kepler mistakenly believed he had captured Mercury moving in orbit across the sun in May 1607, but he later retracted his report 11 years later and determined he had in fact observed a sunspot group. Now a research team has determined that the sunspot group observed by Kepler belonged to the tail end of solar cycle Minus 14. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service, or ARIES, which began in 1935, is being brought into alignment with many of the agencies it serves by adopting the National Incident Management System's Incident Command System. This is an initiative of the ARRL to update the training of ARIES members to better meet the needs of its partners. A statement by the ARRL reads, in part, This is a first step towards a long-term goal of being recognized by our served partner agencies as a gold standard of volunteer communication support based upon ARIES members' unique experience and capabilities. The training has several levels and specialization areas to provide amateurs with a constant track to advance their skills as well as their understanding of emergency communication practices. The incident command system is used throughout government and non-governmental organizations as well as the private sector to manage efficient deployment of assistance and cooperation at incidents such as severe weather or natural disasters. This Week in Amateur Radio is presenting another chapter of A Century of Amateur Radio, Hams, Organizations, Events, Inventions, from the mind of Chris Cordella, W2PA, and his editing team. Each episode will bring a different aspect of early amateur radio history, coming up here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. Hello and welcome to the DX Corner for your weekly dose of DX. I'm Bill, AJB. Often people will ask me if there's a written copy of the information that I present here. There are so many call signs, dates, and URLs being discussed, you could never remember them until such time as you could write them down. I use most of the same data that you hear in the DX Corner for the weekly DX column in the Ohio Section Journal. If you just Google ARRL Ohio Section, 
you will find the Ohio Section website and you can subscribe to the weekly journal and get most of this information. The actual website is arrl-ohio.org. This is a free journal and you don't need to be an ARL member to receive it. You won't get the well-rounded information that you get from the This Week in Amateur Radio podcast, but you will get the DX information that I'm talking about. So here's what's happening in the world of DX. This section of DX News comes from Bernie, W3UR, editor of the Daily DX, the Weekly DX, and the House DX column in QST. If you would like a free two-week trial of the Daily DX, your only source of real-time DX information, just drop me a note at thedxmentor at gmail.com and I'll get it arranged. The following is an update from the ARRL website. And this is as of 8-22-2024, a week ago. Work is continuing to return the DXCC systems to service. DXCC award processing, including the online DXCC application system, is unavailable at this time. While all DXCC user data is secure and unaffected, we have taken the precautionary measure of keeping the service offline until we can ensure the security and integrity of our networks. As previously reported, the Worked All States applications are being processed. WAS certificates and endorsement stickers are being mailed. VUCC applications are also being processed and certificates and endorsement stickers are also being mailed. Thank you for your continued patience and understanding. And I will pass along updates every time they post one. Preparing for the Secure Worldwide DX Contest, CW, Holger, ZL3IO, has updated us on his plans to activate Chatham Island's ZL7DX. He is shipping material and supplies from Napier to the Chatham Islands in mid-September. He has confirmed flights to ZL7 for October 15th to the 31st. That trip will be for maintenance of the existing antennas in preparation for the lattice towers, end quote. They plan to, quote, pour concrete foundations for lattice towers and guywise. The plan is to move the existing antennas higher for the CQ Worldwide DX Contest, CW, in late November. A top-band antenna is also on the agenda. Holger is planning a likely low-power effort in the CQ Worldwide DX Contest single sideband, operating with his own call, ZL7IO. Holger's daughter, ZL4YL, Xenia, will join him for a week around that time, uh, of the CQ Worldwide DX Contest CW at the end of November. She will be QRV as ZL7YL. That will be their call sign during the contest, maybe a single op all band or multi-single effort. Holger would prefer a multi-two effort. However, even if they ran low power, they would quote, run out of power within 10 hours. The site is powered by a 10 kilowatt hour battery and solar power. While Holger is there in October, he will see if he can secure a generator. E51 EME in the South Cooks Islands is QRV on 6 meters through September 15th. This is grid square BG08CW. ZL1RS Bob will use an ICOM 705 to a homebrew kilowatt 6 meter amplifier into a pair of 5 element Yaggies stacked on a new homebrew 11 meter tilt over mast. Following this operation, Bob will upload his log to LOTW. Paper QSLs will be available in October through Clublog. Donate to this effort via PayPal. W5ZN suggests being alert in the afternoon on 6 meters for E51 EME on 50.313 MHz FT8. This one has been heard in the U.S. South recently. E51 EME is also sometimes on 10 meter in his afternoons and he is on the island for a couple of weeks of vacation. At home in New Zealand, he is ZL1RS. On 6 meter, this time he has a pair of 5 element 6 meter Yagi stacked and a kilowatt output and a QTH overlooking the ocean. Also, in the middle of the night in the US, E51 EME has a good EME signal at his local moonrise and moonset. Joe, a local ham WAGEX, worked E51 EME from southwestern Ohio, so it can be done. We have another uh, South Cook from E51 WLG. That will be activated by N2WLG, Tom. Tom plans to be on Rarotonga, South Cook Island, September 1st to the 8th, CW and digital on 40 through 10. QSL to his home QTH or use Logbook of the World. Tango Alpha 1 Hotel Zulu, Tev, is heading to Jersey Island, where he will be QRV as MJ stroke TA18Z from September 11th to the 16th, including participation in the Worked All Europe single sideband contest. 
he'll have an FT891 and a long wire antenna. And you can QSL via LOTW, Club Log, QRZ, and EQSL. You can also QSL directly to his callbook address, TA18Z. In celebration of the 61st anniversary of Saba Day, special call 9 Mike 6 one s is QRV until September 16th. Saba Day is the celebration of the independence of Saba, East Malaysia, which is on August 31st. The C5 Tango and C5 India call signs have come through for the late November de-expedition to the Gambia by a group of European hams. They plan to operate from the mainland November 25th to the 29th with a possible trip to Bajol Islands, uh, which is IOTA AF060, when they will switch to the C5I call sign. They plan 60 through 6 meters and various modes. QSL to EA5GL and they will upload to LOTW even while they're still in Gambia. ZD7W is planned for October and November with a trip to St. Helena Island by Oliver W6NV. He will get a station set up to do the CQ Worldwide Sideband and CW weekends. He is planning on the unassisted category. OZ1DJJ Bo should be QRV from Greenland until September 12th, actually from West Greenland, where he will operate from various locations. He says, quote, don't expect too much of me as it's not a de-expedition. And you can QSL the OZ1DJJ via OZ0J. Bill, G0VDE, is traveling to Pitcairn Island where he plans to be active as VP6WR from September 5th to the 15th. But first he will be heading to Tahiti on August 31st where he will be staying for a few days, then on to Managreva Island on September 3rd. He'll return to Managreva on September 17th and will be QRV as FO stroke G0VDE until September 21st. He then goes back to Tahiti and will fly back home on September 24th. There is a group of American hams headed to Pago Pago, American Samoa, next month. They will be QRV as KH8 Tango from September 2nd to the 16th. Plans are to give, quote, as many of the deserving as possible a chance to work an all-time new one or a new band or mode country, end quote. They will be QRV on 160 through 6 meters on CW, sideband, FT8 and FT4. W5SJ Bill will be the KH8 T pilot. You can email him at kaht at gmail.com. AA7JV, George, is planning to operate the CQ Worldwide DXCW contest in November from the Marquesa Islands FO stroke M. At the moment, he does not know his call sign, but stay tuned because that'll be a good one. Michelle, IZ8PWN, is planning a honeymoon, quote, holiday style de expedition, end quote to the Thadushi Island Resort in the Maldives, a Quebec, from September 6th through the 13th. He will be on single sideband and possibly FT8 on 40, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. Michelle will be running 100 watts into a multi-band dipole. VA3QR, Phil, is back in Panama and his QRV as HP3 stroke VA3QR as he awaits his new Panamanian call sign. Listen for him on 40 through 10 meters and 6 meters. The 6 Oscar 3 Tango de-expedition team, who are going to northwestern Somalia in September, have announced that they will not be using Super Fox, but rather going with MSHV instead. Quote, having carefully weighed up the pros and cons of using Super Fox mode, while recognizing that if, that if developed, it could become a high standard, at the moment we feel it is still too young to use. End quote. If you're someone who likes podcasts and or YouTube episodes, the DX Mentor has a discussion all about 3D printing with 3D printing expert Bob, Whiskey, 7, Whiskey Victor 7 Whiskey. Check it out on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So finally, we have our contest update section. I know that the ARRL contest sheet is read elsewhere in this podcast and that the contests that I mention are sometimes redundant. However, there are a few contests that I have found to be especially useful for DXers who are trying to fill band slots or to get entities or zones in the log that may otherwise be difficult to get. The first contest to mention this week is the CW Ops CW Open. CW Ops organization sponsors the CW Ops Test or CWT, which are fun weekly competitions at times thought to be optimum for amateurs in IT regions one, two, and three. 
The CW Open, which is held on the first Saturday in September, is guided by the same principles along with enhancements to make it serious in an annual competitive event. The object is to work as many CW stations worldwide as possible within each session. There are three separate competitions at three separate times. Each is called a session. Each station may be worked once per band in each session. Entry can be made to any or all of the sessions. Each session is scored separately. Entry into multiple sessions will be added together for a combined score in a separate, additional aspect to this event. The three sessions are September 7th, from 0 Zulu to 0359, from 1200 Zulu to 1559, and 2000 Zulu to 2359. More information can be found at the CWOps website, which is cwops.org. And I can tell you from experience, this is an absolute blast. Now, these guys are nice, they're friendly, they'll help you out, and it's really a great time. So if you get a chance, block out September 7th and give that a try. The second contest event is the All Asian DX Contest Phone. The single sideband portion is held September 7th through the 8th for 48 hours. The standard HF bands will be used 10 through 160. The exchange is slightly different as it is the signal report and your age. More information can be gotten from the WA7 BNM website. Until next week, this is Bill, AJB saying 73, and thanks to my XYL Karen for her love and support. I hope to see you in the pileups. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available to download as a podcast from anywhere on the web. Podcasts are available. Welcome to the 10th segment of Ham Radio History, a century of amateur radio, hams, organizations, events, inventions. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. I want to thank Chris Cadella, W2PA, for allowing us to use his superb website in the preparation of these programs. So, enjoy this, the next of many chapters of Ham Radio History. Aerials, Attachments, and Audibility. Aside from the spark gap, the aerial was then, as the antenna system is today, a source of intense interest and experimentation. Aerials partly governed resonance in both transmitter and receiver, and therefore played an integral part in determining the wavelength of operation. In QSD, the old man advised that amateurs should not simply make aerials as long as possible, but stick with lengths of around 175 meters with short lead-in and ground connections so as to stay close to the 200-meter limit and operate efficiently there. At least four kinds of antennas were in widespread use, the vertical fan, umbrella, inverted L, and T aerial. A simple vertical wire was also used, called a Hertz or Marconi aerial, depending on whether or not a ground connection was involved. A fan antenna consisted of several vertical wires connected close together at the base and then fanned out up to a high horizontal support wire suspended between two masts. This was considered the most effective amateur antenna at the time and the one to choose if you had the room. The umbrella aerial, not very popular at all, consisted of a single vertical support from which a conical arrangement of wires sloped down towards the ground forming a circle around the base. The inverted L and T antennas were pretty much the same as they are today, except they invariably involved several parallel wires at the top, separated by insulating spreaders. As today on 160 meters, these were perhaps the most popular kind of aerial because they are small and require simpler supports, yet are effective radiators. All aerials simply had single wire connections directly to the transmitter, possibly including an inductor or capacitor for tuning. Two inductor feed lines were yet to be widely used. Humor writer Charles Wolfe, a frequent QSD contributor, summed up aerials in this way. The aerial is the first thing a prospective amateur considers. 
The aerial is also the last thing the disgusted veteran considers when about to dismantle. Incidentally, one continues to consider it throughout his entire career. Consideration of the aerial enriches the vocabulary. Even as Minerva sprang full-grown from the forehead of Jove, so do many new, picturesque, and very expressive cuss words spring spontaneously from the lips of the hapless bug as he considers the wreck of a fallen aerial. The last thing the enthusiast considers at night is his aerial, wondering if it will last the night and knowing blame well it won't. The first thing the same enthusiast considers in the morning is his aerial, wondering if it's still up and knowing blame well it isn't. Maxim's own station, an exemplar of the state of the art, was profiled as such in a two-page article in July 1920 QST. Coincidentally, this is the same issue in which the ARRL diamond emblem was first introduced, its schematic antenna symbol evocative of the fan antenna. His own impressive fan installation appeared that month in the first photograph ever to appear on a QSD cover and was described as the most novel departure from regular practice, although the article did not say exactly how. Maxim Spark Transmitter was located in the basement to be close to the ground connection and to keep its noise isolated from the first floor library where the receiver key, changeover switch, and other apparatus made up the operating position. A non-synchronous rotary gap was at the heart of the transmitter. After years of experimentation, he had arrived at his 1920 design, a four-electrode rotor in the shape of a 15-inch diameter cross was driven at 7,000 RPM inside an asbestos-lined wooden box containing two stationary electrodes. An earlier version of this gap had been previously described in an anonymously written article without identifying it as maxims. The rotor and nettle hub were live at the high voltage and insulated only by the drive belt linking the rotor pulley on the front of the box with the one on the drive motor mounted next to it. The main power was connected through the key on the operating desk directly to the main transformer that charged his .01 microfarad 24,000 volt Dubilier mica condenser. With this transmitter, his station operated with 770 watts input power and had been heard as far away as Nebraska. In point of consistent performance, we believe it ranks with the top liners in the amateur world, wrote ARRL Secretary Kenneth Warner. This is the same rotary gap that, along with some other transmitting components, can be seen today, minus the asbestos lining, at W1AW, the Maxim Memorial Station, at ARRL headquarters. Although several hams operated from Maxim Station, you know who was at the key by their sign. Maxim was HP and Warner KB. Maxim's call sign had changed again later to 1AW. Before the advent of standardized signal reports such as RST or objective measurements of received signal level in microvolts or even the sometimes less standard S units, hams described signals in ways that would most likely be familiar to other hams. One such way that appeared frequently in early QST was to state how far from the headphones a received signal could be heard. In the days when speakers were uncommon, and a receiver was little more than an antenna, a passive detector, and headphones, the sounds you'd hear were literally generated directly by the signal itself. What better way could there be to describe the strength of such a signal than by how far across the room you could still hear and copy it? This kind of description carried through well into the age of vacuum tubes. Included in this material are quotes from the following. The Old Man... Natural Wavelengths of Antennas, QST, December 1916, page 24. C.S. Wolf, Aerials, QST, November 1916, page 33. Amateur Radio Stations, QST, July 1920, page 35. Anonymous, A New Type Rotary Gap, QST, February 1917, page 22. E.E. E. House, Receiving with a Pancake Tuner, QST, March 1916, page 55. 
with appreciation to W2PA Chris Cadella for allowing us the use of his website's materials, Ham Radio History, A Century of Amateur Radio, Ham's Organizations, Events, Inventions, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. ARRL New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, presented a signed official citation from Massachusetts Governor Maura Healy and Lieutenant Governor Kimberly Driscoll to mark the ARRL New England Division Convention's 100th anniversary. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is at League Headquarters with this report. The presentation made at the convention's August 27th Grand Banquet was among the special events highlighted at the Northeast Ham Exposition. And that citation reads, On behalf of the residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I'm pleased to confer upon you this governor's citation in recognition of the 100th anniversary of the American Radio Relay League's New England Division Convention held this year in Marlboro and in deep gratitude to the approximately 13,000 amateur radio operators in the Commonwealth who dedicate their time, knowledge, and equipment to assist their communities. Northeast Ham Exposition Program Chair Skip Youngberg, K1NKR, reports the New England Division conventions have been held for 100 years, although there haven't been 100 years annual conventions. New England's first ARRL-sponsored division convention was held in Springfield, Massachusetts on March 28th and 29th in 1924. Division conventions moved to Massachusetts in 1925, Providence, Rhode Island in 1926, Hartford, Connecticut in 1927, and Boston, Massachusetts in 1928. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Boston-based Massachusetts state conventions were typically held in combination with the Boston Ham Fest. Division, state, and section conventions filled the average ham's social calendar from the 1920s to the 1960s. Thanks to program chairperson Skip Youngberg, K1NKR, for contributing to this story. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. A new transistor in development inside a Massachusetts laboratory is said to be extremely tough and resilient and offers super-fast switching while meeting or even exceeding industry standards. Researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology first announced the transistor's development in 2021 when they published the results of their study which explored the use of an ultra-thin ferroelectric material made from boron nitride. At that time the report was carried in the journal Science, researchers wrote only of the possibilities. Now it is a reality. Working inside the laboratory, the scientists created that faster, more energy-efficient transistor, and they claim that even after 100 billion switches, there are no signs of degradation. Researchers told Popular Mechanics magazine that for electronic devices such as computers, this eliminates the need for selective storage on a chip. Scientists also say that boron nitride has another advantage. It remains stable over long periods of time because its polarization can be reversed when there is an electric field. The next reality, actually manufacturing it, could be a lot tougher. Scientists acknowledge that despite the great gains in this development, they still don't have a way to mass produce it. Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenhorsel signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Privacy Commissioner of Canada, Philippe Dufresne, to strengthen information sharing and enforcement cooperation between the two regulators. The agreement establishes the parameters for the two regulators to exchange information in order to enforce compliance with laws in both countries and to share knowledge and expertise on regulatory policies and technical efforts related to applicable law. The Federal Communications Commission is responsible for implementing and enforcing America's communications laws and regulations. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada oversees compliance with Canada's two federal privacy laws that set out the rules for how federal government institutions and certain businesses must handle personal information. Foundations of Amateur Radio 
The International Amateur Radio Union, or IARU, is the governing body of our community. It represents us on the world stage through the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. As I've discussed before, it consists of four separate organisations working together, the International Amateur Radio Union, the global body, and three regional ones, Region 1, 2 and 3, each representing the hobby of amateur radio. Previously, I've looked at the constitution of the IARU to get a sense of its purpose in the world. At the time, I mentioned the notion of comparing the four organisations against each other, since ostensibly they're doing the same thing for a different part of the world. Each of these regional bodies was created separately by different groups of people, and their constitutions reflect that. The global IARU constitution, last updated in 1989, consists of nine pages. The IARU Region 1 Constitution, with proposed amendments from 2020, has 31 pages. The English version of the Region 2 Constitution, since there's also a Spanish one, was amended in 2019, has six pages, including two copies of Article 2, and refers regularly to the Global IARU Constitution. And finally, Region 3, amended in 2012, has 15 pages. What is striking at first glance is just how poorly these documents are constructed. Formatting, inconsistent spelling, indentation, general layout, and all are lacking attention to detail. I think that this reflects poorly on the internal workings of the IARU, but I digress. Curiously, the Region 3 website has a whole section on proposed changes to the Constitution. Many of those changes are around the election of officials and voting procedures. It also includes the use of modern communications like email and remote conference facilities on internet platforms. One paragraph stood out, quote, It was also realised that changes would need to be made to formally recognise that we will, as happened at the online conference in 2021, have females as well as males taking responsible positions in IARU Region 3, end quote. It must have come as quite a shock to the delegates to learn that there are females in our hobby. This must have already happened in Region 1, since there is a reference to he, she, in relation to being elected. Mind you, use of the word they must not have occurred to the authors. But don't worry, we shouldn't rush these things. The international body and Region 2 constitutions both use he for roles. I will point out that the international body has a weasel clause where it states, among other things, quote, Words importing only the masculine gender include the feminine gender and the neutral gender, end quote. It's a good start, but falls short of standards expected today. If you're not sure what all the fuss is about, let me illustrate. The term of office of the president shall be for a period of five years from the date of ratification of porcupine nomination, and porcupine shall remain in office until the nomination of porcupine's successor has been ratified. If that felt jarring for you, you might get some sense of what it feels like for someone reading that with gender pronouns that don't match the text. A better solution would be, The term of office of the President shall be for a period of five years from the date of ratification of their nomination, and they shall remain in office until the nomination of their successor has been ratified. It's not the first time we've struck this type of issue. It's high time that we did something about it. Over a year ago, I pointed out that OM, old man, and XYL, ex young lady, were derogatory, and we should replace them with OP, operator, and SO, significant other. A year before that, I proposed a revision to the Amateurs Code to make its language inclusive and reflective of the wider community in which we operate. I've had discussions with people who identify across the gender spectrum about much of this, and the overwhelming feedback I receive is that our community is old white men clamouring to grow the hobby without a clue that words they use are part of the problem. So, credit to Region 1 for implementing some of this and to Region 3 for starting this conversation. I don't doubt that there are members in the global IARU and Region 2 who would like to see this implemented, and to you I say, it's time. High time to review what language our community uses to identify itself to the wider community.
More generally, as the governing and representative global bodies, you should be leading the way and providing guidance to the member societies. So next time you promote our community, refer to others, link to articles and attempt to encourage participation, you should take a moment and ask yourself if what you're saying is truly speaking to people who are not old white men, and if that's the case, what you might do to embrace the wider community. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The FCC has approved the launch of a low Earth orbit communications array of five satellites on V band that is expected to open the door for U.S. smartphones to make use of space based cellular broadband services across the nation. The satellites have been given the OK to operate in the 37.5 to 42 gigahertz range for space to earth communications and the ranges of 47.2 to 50.2 gigahertz and 50.4 to 51.4 gigahertz for earth to space communications. Approval was also given for the use of 430 to 440 megahertz for space to earth and earth to space transmissions. 2025 to 2110 megahertz for earth to space transmissions and 2200 through 2290 megahertz for space to earth transmissions the approvals are granted to texas-based asd space mobile for what the company is characterizing as the largest communications array in history in low earth orbit you are listening to this week in amateur radio available to download as a podcast from anywhere on the web podcasts are available Bruce Page, KK5DO, is here now with this week's AMSAT report. Bruce? Thanks, John. On August 16th, SpaceX Transporter 11 launched 116 satellites. One that is noteworthy to HAMS is from Portland State University in Oregon. Along with Portland Aerospace Society, they built OrSat 0.5, which is a 2U CubeSat. Not only will they be testing an open source ADIX for pointing the antenna and camera, but also demonstrating the DX Wi-Fi on S-Band 802.11b with speeds of 1 megabit per second. You can receive telemetry data from the satellite on 436.500 megahertz and decode using 9600 baud GMSK with DK3WN's Get Kiss version 1.4.2. The 1 megabit per second for the experiment sounds very interesting. This could lead to being able to download large pictures in high resolution or even digital voice. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Back to you, John. And thanks, Bruce, for that report. It is time once again for the Propagation Forecast Report. Brought to us each week by our resident solar prognosticator Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington. The Australian Space Weather Forecasting Center issued a geomagnetic disturbance warning at 0200 UTC on August 29, 2024. The solar wind environment remains elevated due to ongoing coronal mass ejection effects. G0 to G1 geomagnetic conditions are expected on August 29th. Increased geomagnetic activity is expected due to coronal mass ejection for August 29th. This week, seven new sunspot groups emerged, with two on August 22nd, one on August 25th, two on August 26th and two more on August 28th. Average daily sunspot number declined slightly from 180.3 to 177.1, and average daily solar flux declined from 232.7 to 229. The planetary and middle latitude A index averages were about the same, at 12.3 and 12. So looking at the predicted solar flux values for the near term, it will be 215 on August 31st, 210 on September 1st, 215 on September 2nd through the 4th, 250 on September 5th, and 275 on September 6th through the 8th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index for the near term, it will be 5 and 8 on August 31st to September 1st, then hold steady at a value of 5 on September 2nd through the 16th. 
In radio sport this week, more great contest. August 31st, the Feldhell Sprint, that's digital. August 31st as well through September 1st, the Russian WW Multimode Contest, that's CW phone and digital. August 31st through September 1st, the UKEIDX Contest, single sideband, phone. September 1st and the 2nd, WARC Tennessee QSO Party, CW phone and digital. On September 2nd, the RSGB 80-meter Autumn Series, single sideband and phone. September 2nd and 3rd, the MIQRP Labor Day CW Sprint, that is CW. September 3rd, the ARS Spartan Sprint, CW. And on September 4th, the uh, 4th through the 5th on September, the uh, UKEICC 80-meter contest, and that is phone. Remember to visit the ARRL contest calendar for more events and information. Upcoming Section State and Division conventions on August 30th through September 1st, it's the Shelby Ham Fest sponsoring the ARRL North Carolina State Convention. That's in Shelby, North Carolina. August 31st, the September Symposium sponsoring the ARRL Santa Barbara Section Convention. That's in Camarillo, California. September 8th, the ARRL Southern New Jersey Section Convention in Mollica Hill, New Jersey. And on September 20th through the 22nd, it's the Duke City Ham Fest sponsoring the ARRL New Mexico State Convention. That's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And don't forget to search the ARRL Ham Fest Convention and Database calendar to find more events in your area. SpaceX successfully launched 116 payloads aboard its Falcon 9 rocket as part of the Transporter 11 rideshare mission on August 16, 2024. The launch occurred at 11.56 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. This mission is the latest in SpaceX's series of rideshare launches, which provide small satellites from various countries an opportunity to reach orbit without needing dedicated launch vehicles. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9's first stage booster successfully returned to landing zone 4, marking its 12th flight and 20th landing at LZ-4. Transponder 11 carried a diverse range of payloads, including satellites from Japan, Chile, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Among the Australian payloads were three satellites launched by the Australian Space Agency. Oregon also had a key payload on Transponder 11 with the launch of Orisat 0.5, the state's second satellite. Developed by the Portland State Aerospace Society at Portland State University, Orisat 0.5 is a 2U CubeSat designed to demonstrate two critical systems, the attitude determination and control system of the modular Orisat bus and the Cirrus Flux camera, which uses shortwave infrared technology. Deployed into a 510-kilometer sun-synchronous low-Earth orbit, The satellite began transmitting its first data beacons just 16 minutes after deployment, marking a significant milestone for the Portland State Aerospace Society team. Orisat 0.5's mission includes testing an open-source ADCS designed for precise antenna and camera pointing on amateur radio satellites and demonstrating the DX Wi-Fi S-band 802.11b bidirectional radio system for high speed 1 megabit per second communication. Additionally, it aims to provide openly published flight performance data, including power and thermal characteristics, to support the development of cost effective scalable satellite systems. Telemetry data from Orisat 0.5 can be received on 436.500 MHz and decoded using 9600 baud GMSK with DK3WN's Get Kiss Plus V1.4.2 software. The mission also marked a significant achievement for ExoLaunch, the satellite deployment company responsible for integrating 42 of the 116 satellites on the Transporter 11 mission. This launch was ExoLaunch's 30th successful integration, representing more than two dozen companies. ExoLaunch CEO Robert Sproles expressed gratitude to their customers and SpaceX, emphasizing the importance of collaboration and innovation in the success of these missions.
Recently aboard the ISS, Canada's Candarm-2 caught its 50th spacecraft in the form of Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo vessel since 2009. Although perhaps not the most prominent part of the International Space Station, the Candarm-2 performs a range of wide essential functions on the outside of the ISS, such as moving equipment around and supporting astronauts during EVAs. Officially called the Space Station Remote Manipulator System, it's part of the three-part mobile servicing system that allows for the Candarm-2 and the Dexter unit to scoot around the non-Russian part of the ISS, attached to power data grapple fixtures on the ISS, and manipulate anything that has a compatible grapple fixture on it. Originally, the MSS was not designed to catch spacecraft when it was installed in 2001 by Space Shuttle Endeavour, but with the U.S. moving away from the space shuttle to a range of unmanned supply craft, which aren't all capable of autonomous docking, this becomes a necessity, with the Japanese HTV with a grapple fixture becoming the first craft to be caught this way in 2009. Since the Canarm-2 was originally designed to manipulate ISS modules, this wasn't a major shift, and the mission was soon planned also started to build a new space station and when the first Axiom orbital segment is launched by 2026. This would become the Axion Station. With the Axiom Station planned to have its own Candarm-like system, this will likely mean the Candarm-2 and the rest of the MSS will be decommissioned along with the rest of the ISS by 2031. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. The private astronaut mission Polaris Dawn is planned to launch aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft on September 1st at 3.38 a.m. EDT from pad LC-39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission has a groundbreaking objective, the first commercial spacewalk. The four-member crew consisting of Anna Menon, Scott Poteet, Jared Isaacman, and Sarah Gillis arrived at the Kennedy Space Center on August 19th to finalize preparations. This mission, the first of the Polaris program, marks a significant step in commercial space exploration and launch aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon atop a Falcon 9 rocket. Scheduled to last five days, the Polaris Dawn mission will propel the Crew Dragon spacecraft to altitudes reaching 1,400 kilometers, the highest for a crewed mission since Apollo 17 in 1972. The mission's objectives are multifaceted, including testing laser intersatellite links with SpaceX Starlink satellites and conducting 40 experiments. However, the highlight will be the spacewalk, a historic first for a private mission and the first from a Crew Dragon spacecraft. The spacewalk will involve all four astronauts, with two emerging from the hatch in new SpaceX-developed extravehicular activity suits for a brief yet pivotal two-hour spacewalk. Jared Isaacman, the billionaire backing the Polaris program and commander of Polaris Dawn, emphasized the importance of the spacewalk during a press conference after arriving at KSC. The idea is to learn as much as we possibly can about this suit and get it back to the engineers to form future suit design evolutions, Isaacman stated. The spacewalk is scheduled for flight day three, with preparations beginning shortly after launch. The crew will undergo a pre-breathing protocol to adjust the cabin's atmospheric pressure and increase oxygen levels, a process essential for the EVA. SpaceX engineer Sarah Gellis, serving as a mission specialist, detailed the crew's rigorous preparations. On flight day two, the astronauts will don the EVA suits for mobility tests inside the spacecraft. During the spacewalk, two astronauts, referred to as EV-1 and EV-2, will take turns exiting the spacecraft for approximately 15 to 20 minutes each. Isaacman noted that while the idea of a free-floating spacewalk was considered, the crew will instead perform a hands-free demonstration with their feet securely attached to the spacecraft's mobility aids, underscoring the mission's cautious approach. The mission's development has been intensely focused on the spacewalk and the associated EVA suits. The EVA probably makes up the majority of the development for Polaris Dawn, Isaacman said, acknowledging the inherent risks. 
SpaceX Vice President Bill Gertzenmeyer, formerly of NASA, confirmed that extensive safety protocols have been implemented. He mentioned a recent issue where engineers identified and resolved the static electric discharge risk, ensuring the crew's safety during the spacewalk. Polaris Dawn's mission will conclude with a demonstration of Starlink capabilities on Flight Day 4, followed by re-entry on Day 6. As the first of three planned missions under the Polaris program, Polaris Dawn represents a significant leap forward in commercial spaceflight, setting the stage for future endeavors, including a potential crewed Starship launch. It is time once again for AMSAT's satellite shorts from all over. And this week we begin in Russia, who successfully launched its 89th Progress cargo spacecraft, Progress MS-28, to the International Space Station on August 15, 2024. The uncrewed spacecraft lifted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan aboard a Soyuz rocket at 0320 UTC. Carrying nearly three tons of food, scientific equipment, and other supplies, the spacecraft autonomously docked with the ISS on August 17th at 0553 UTC, connecting to the rear port of the Zvezda service module. This docking occurred just days after the previous cargo spacecraft, Progress MS-26, was deorbited on August 12th following its six-month mission. With its arrival, Progress MS-28 joined two other freighters, including Cygnus NG-21 and three crewed spacecraft already at the ISS. The successful mission continues Russia's long-standing contribution to ISS resupply operations. Next, the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission is making headlines with its dual-gravity assist maneuver this week. After a successful flyby of the moon on August 19, 2024, JUICE passed the Earth on August 20, 2024, marking the first-ever lunar Earth double flyby. This maneuver uses Earth's gravity to adjust JUICE's trajectory, setting it up for a flyby of Venus in August 2025, and ultimately aiming for Jupiter's orbit by July 2031. The spacecraft's two cameras are capturing and sending images back to Earth, while mission operators are closely monitoring the high-risk maneuver to ensure precision. With Jupiter being nearly 500 million miles away, this gravity assist strategy allows JUICE to conserve fuel and carry a variety of scientific instruments. The mission's success relies on careful navigation and timing, as any deviation could jeopardize its ambitious goals. And our final story this week, the FCC has granted SpaceX permission to upgrade its first-generation Starlink satellites with second-generation technology, aiming to enhance broadband quality for its users. This upgrade is expected to improve service, especially in polar regions, by using advanced beam forming and digital processing technologies. SpaceX initially launched first-generation satellites in 2019 and applied in 2023 to integrate the new technology. Despite pushback from DISH Network over potential interference issues, the FCC dismissed these concerns, supporting SpaceX's plans to optimize spectrum use and increase network capacity. SpaceX will replace the older satellites with upgraded ones as they reach the end of their operational period, rather than deorbiting them rapidly. The overall goal is to provide more robust service to underserved areas across the country. The United States National Science Foundation National Radio Astronomy Observatory and its administrator, Associated Universities Incorporated, have created Supernova an online educational platform that provides inclusive, equitable access to radio technology learning and training. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more. Our goal is to broaden participation in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math by offering no-cost training and education in skills that help prepare learners for STEM careers, said Valerie Bogan, NSF NRAO Supercanova Program Manager. The Supercanova website has a wealth of free educational resources for teachers and learners of all ages. Topics include history of radio astronomy, the physics of radio technology, and even cube satellites. With a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, learners can now enroll in two self-paced courses to learn the fundamentals of radio communications. This is a great opportunity to share amateur radio with a new generation of potential ham radio enthusiasts, said Project Instructor Jesse Alexander, WB2IFS. 
Lindale Von Schill, director of the NSFNRAO, Director of Diversity Inclusion, notes that many organizations have come together to make these resources possible. Thanks to the support of the U.S. National Science Foundation with administration by AUI and additional support from the ARDC, the Supernova program has emerged as a valuable and free resource to students and educators across the country. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Thank you, John. The Technician Amateur Radio License and EMS course introduces learners to electromagnetic spectrum using amateur radio as a vehicle and helps them prepare to take the exam. Those who have earned their technician license can advance to the general amateur radio license and EMS course. Starting with the basics of radio waves, electronics, and simple radio equipment, Students then continue learning challenging topics, such as frequency, propagation, antennas, and general circuitry. Laurel Tincher, program manager of the Terre Haute Children's Museum, called QRZ in a manner of speaking, and the Wabash Valley Amateur Radio Association answered that call. She invited the club to present a day of ham-related activities to showcase the kinds of things amateur radio can do. According to club president Kevin Berland, K9HX, 100 or so visitors on Saturday, August 24th, got that opportunity. They participated in a radio-related scavenger hunt and enjoyed activities that taught them a little more about Morse code. As the hams made QSOs on SSB using a remote-controlled HF station, the youngsters got a better understanding of what HF propagation can do. The visitors didn't just take away a better understanding of amateur radio. One lucky youngster won the random drawing for a small STEM robotics kit. According to Kevin, quite a few of them expressed an interest in working toward getting their license. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. The 25th anniversary of Route 66 on the air will have a new twist this year, a California Rover. W6V, manned by Annie Lewis, N6ACL, and John Litz, NZ6Q, will be driving the route from Santa Monica, California to Chicago, Illinois, activating historic sites, points of interest, and blogging the adventure. They will operate single sideband, FT8, and CW from stop to stop, multi-op single transmitter, and both will be on the air when they stop for the evening. The idea of doing a start to finish Route 66 rover from one end to the other started several years ago with help of their friend Dan Reed, KB6 UNC, now a silent key. The event from 0001 Zulu, September 7th, to 2359 Zulu on September 15th is sponsored by the Citrus Belt Amateur Radio Club and the Barstow Amateur Radio Club. It celebrates the Mother Road, United States Highway 66, which was established in 1926 and was the first major roadway improvement to link the West Coast with the nation's heartland. There will be 23 one-by-one special event stations along the route from Santa Monica to Chicago. In 2023, there were 77 such stations, making a total of 623 contacts during the nine-day event. Email route66ota at yahoo.com with questions or for more additional information. As the summer wraps up in the Northern Hemisphere, so too does the Youngsters on the Air camp that took place in the Czech Republic. Campers finished their week of immersion in amateur radio and friendship at the Youngsters on the Air camp on Friday, August 23rd. Now all that's left is to remember the experience and to share it. Reese Williams, M0WGY, stroke AJ6XD, who represented the Radio Society of Great Britain at the camp, wrote a daily blog that recounts such daily activities as kit building, balloon launching, and operation of the special call sign OL24YOTA. If you weren't one of the campers, you can read the blog and experience that memorable week vicariously in words and pictures. 
The camp is organized by the Czech Radio Club and the Youth Working Group of IARU Region 1. This past winter, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, announced that Pat Nelson, KE0QXD, had recently joined their conduct review committee. Familiar with her tireless spirit, they were looking forward to working with her. Sadly, that partnership never happened. Pat died suddenly a few days later on January 29th. The contributions she could have made would have been the latest in an amateur radio tenure marked by creativity and a capacity for giving and volunteering. Pat had a long association as a host and volunteer with KFAI Radio, a community broadcast station in Minneapolis and St. Paul. A certified specialist in IT, she also assisted with programming and ran a company, Nelson Works, LLC, which provided computer training and support. When she joined the station, she became friends with Mike Stapp, KE0WW, a longtime ham who introduced her to amateur radio. For Pat, that marked yet another beginning. She became licensed in 2018, and her commitment grew over the years. In 2022, she produced and hosted a special program on KFAI in honor of International Women's Day, focusing on women active in amateur radio. Pat also became a volunteer examiner at the Aurora Amateur Radio Group and served on its VE advisory board. She was a lifetime member of the O Mike Amateur Radio Association, an international group founded in 1952 by black radio amateurs, and she had previously served the association as secretary. In January 2023, Pat became the first guest speaker at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's Ham Radio Project in Virginia, led by Jesse Alexander, WB2. IFS. Supported by the ARDC, the project familiarizes students with amateur radio and the electromagnetic spectrum. Pat was 68. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, successfully launched its third and final developmental flight of the small satellite launch vehicle on August 16th. The launch, conducted from the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sariyakota, India, placed two satellites, EOS-8 and SR-0, Demosat, into orbit. Marking the completion of the SSLV's development SIP phases, this achievement enables the rocket's operational use by Indian Industry and New Space India Limited. The primary payload, EOS-08, is an Earth observation satellite developed by ISRO's UR Rao Satellite Center. The satellite was placed into a 475-kilometer low-Earth orbit about 13 minutes after liftoff. The secondary payload, SRO, Demosat, was developed by Space Kids India and is a 0.2-kilogram CubeSat designed for educational and amateur radio purposes. Deployed into the same orbit as EOS-08, the Demosat is equipped with an inertial measurement unit and a low-rod digipeter, the satellite's mission includes raising awareness about amateur radio and nanosatellites among students, transmitting health telemetry, and serving as a digital packet store and forward system for radio amateurs worldwide. Additionally, SRO Demosat will act as a demonstration unit to qualify new CubeSat deployer, reflecting Space Kids India's innovative approach to space technology. Space Kids India, which developed the SRO Demosat, has a history of launching educational satellites. The SRO Demosat continues the tradition, serving both educational and amateur radio communities. Operating on a 437.4 MHz downlink, the satellite supports various digital communications modes, including a 6K9 FSK AX25, 4 FSK SSDV, and 28K4 LoRa. This allows radio amateurs globally to engage with the satellite and collect valuable data. This mission also highlights the potential of space technology to ensure next generation of engineers and scientists while advancing the capabilities of the amateur radio community. Serving the amateur radio community for a quarter century, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Heard around the world on the amateur bands and streaming on the internet.
And finally this week, we leave you with a short amateur radio story. Once upon a time, in the heart of Europe, nestled amongst the picturesque landscapes of the Czech Republic, a magical gathering took place. This gathering brought together 22 YLs from 11 different countries. They met at a charming location known as OK5Z, a place where the air buzzed with excitement and the possibilities of new friendships. Each YL was filled with enthusiasm and determination, eager to make the most of their time together. With their transceivers and antennas at the ready, they logged an impressive 17,882 QSOs from 149 different countries. Despite the demanding work, the young ladies found time to enjoy each other's company. They shared laughter, warmth, and support, creating bonds that would last a lifetime. In the evenings, they were joined by a group of brave and kind-hearted OMs. These wise mentors decided to surprise the YLs. They prepared a delicious dinner and played lively music, filling the air with joy and celebration. The gathering was made possible by the generous support of several organizations, including International Amateur Radio Union Region 1. This help and kindness turned this magical event into reality. And so, the story of these 22 YLs and their unforgettable adventures in the Czech Republic became a cherished tale, a reminder of the power of ham radio friendship and the joy of sharing one's passion with the world. Hi, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN, one of the anchors for This Week in Amateur Radio, and I have a few questions. Do you have a good radio voice? Do you have a quiet recording space, own a professional broadcast microphone and DAW software, and know how to use them? Can you commit to a same-day turnaround when given a script assignment? If you answered yes to all of these questions, and you're willing to volunteer your time to give a little something back to the ham radio hobby, then lend us your voice and join our anchor team for This Week in Amateur Radio. To learn more and see if you have what it takes, contact George Bowen, W2XBS, via email at W2XBS77 at gmail.com, or look him up on QRZ.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website at twiar.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you a 73.